Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer. So no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating today. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's all totally free with no catch. I highly recommend you give it a try. Download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to spotify.com slash podcasters to get started. Welcome back to the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. I'm your host and founder, Rebecca Larson. And today I'm happy to welcome back once again, David Holland. The Tudor's Dynasty podcast. I am David Holland. Thanks for joining us today in our mini series called Wolf Hall Weekend mini series, which is dedicated to the work and the writing of Dame Hilary Mantel, whose famous Wolf Hall trilogy, I'm sure all of the listeners are very well aware of. And today I'm thrilled to be able to welcome Dr. Elizabeth Norton to our session. Um, Elizabeth is the uh, author of 12 books on the Queens of England and the Tudor dynasty period. And I'm also thrilled to say that she's going to be speaking at a weekend that we're holding next year, June the 22nd and the 23rd in England at a place called Cadet House, where there will be a whole array of auspicious speakers like Elizabeth. And what we're going to be doing is diving in, having a really immersive experience of the life of Thomas Cromwell through the eyes of Hilary Mantel and, of course, all the other array of characters what I've invited uh, Dr. Elizabeth um, to do today is to visit with me uh, the life of Jane Seymour, the Queen Jane Seymour. So welcome, Elizabeth. Thank you for, for joining us today. Thank uh, you very much. It's always a pleasure. And I'm so excited to be involved with the Wolf Hall weekend. It's going to be a wonderful weekend. So just to introduce your book, that the title of your book on Jane Seymour, which is by the way, the first biography, I believe. Uh, has anybody written another biography that you're aware of yet, or is it still you? Uh, yeah, so there was a David Lode's biography uh, a couple of years later, but otherwise very little has been written about Jane. I believe there's a new illustrated life that's just come out and I need to get my hands on, but otherwise very little. I'm actually working on an academic study on Jane for Routledge, which will be out in a few years' time, but we'll be looking in detail at her land ownership and sort of general kind of principles of her queenship, so less of a biography and more of a study. Fantastic. Can't wait. So Jane Seymour, third wife of Henry VIII, so... Uh, died, beheaded, died. So she's the died in the in the first part of that um, uh, prep schoolboy. How, how to remember what happened to the queens of, of Henry VIII. Um, so she died, sadly, giving not long after giving birth to um, Edward VI, of course. Um, right. You say in the title of your book is that Jane Seymour was Henry VIII's true love. Absolutely. So, I mean, it's in, in part, it's intended as a slightly provocative statement because there'll be plenty of people that say she's not his true love. That's Anne Boleyn or it's Catherine of Aragon or maybe Catherine Parr or maybe none of his wives. Um, mm. But the point that I'm making is that absolutely she's not, she doesn't stand out particularly as a wife during her marriage. It's really posthumously where she has her impact. And it's because she is the mother of his son. So she becomes this really important matriarch in the Tudor dynasty. She's in all the family paintings, in spite of the fact that she's died. She, Henry orders prayers to be said for her. Her anniversary of her death is kept. He asked to be buried with Jane specifically. So undoubtedly she she is his most important wife as far as he is concerned and of course a lot of people would take issue with that today and I'm not sure I would argue that she is the most important of the six wives but to Henry she absolutely was and I think on his deathbed if he was reflecting on his wives and his many many failed marriages I think he would look back on the period with Jane with rose-tinted glasses, if you like, but undoubtedly, as far as Henry is concerned, she is his favourite wife. She is a successful wife. She's his true queen. So the big question is why then? What was it about Jane that made her such a favourite um, in Henry's eyes? I mean, the I guess the popular image of Jane is that she's compliant, 
Uh, she's meek. She doesn't didn't particularly argue with him or didn't try to pick fights with him. Unlike uh, Anne Boleyn, who the sort of the taming of the shrew almost um, okay. their their fights were were notorious. So is is that why he potentially she might be his his favorite? Do you think? So I think she has a hard time as queen. Um, you know, she's the lowliest of all of Henry's six wives, um, undoubtedly. I mean, on paper, she and Anne Boleyn are the same rank. They're both gentlemen's daughters. But actually, Anne Boleyn far outranks Jane Seymour. The Boleyns are much more prominent than the Seymours. So I think she comes at her queenship at a real disadvantage. She's very, very lowly. She's got no family to protect her to any great extent. Um, she's very much at the mercy of Henry's whims. And I think that shows in the fact of her queenship um we think of jane as being very meek and mild um i i would interpret some of that particularly about as a woman who is quite frightened um because she has seen the man she has married behead mm. his previous wife he reminds her of that on one occasion when she does attempt to assert some political influence um he actually pointedly says you know look what i did to Anne Boleyn." um so i think a lot of the meekness is actually fear um, it takes Jane a very long time to become pregnant, and she knows that her salvation rests on giving Henry a son. So I think a lot of how we perceive her is through the lens of actually, you know, she's not a queen that's very secure. And in fact, somebody says this about her. I'm trying to think who says that she's a queen that's not very secure. Maybe Chapuis. Um, <laughs> but it's, um, you know, actually, she is on very sketchy ground throughout her entire marriage, which I think isn't necessarily always brought out that clearly when we think about Jane. Um, to Henry, she's absolutely viewed as an opposite to Anne Boleyn. She is the quiet wife, the wife that's not going to give him trouble. Um, she's seen as very pure, um, <laughs> very, um, you know, sort of innocent. Although, I mean, Chapuis again, this is Chapuis again, he actually... Um, he doubts that she'd still be a virgin, having been at court so long when she marries Henry, which is sort of an interesting aside that I'd like to know more on. Mm. Um, but I do think the Jane we see is partly a Jane that has been constructed by what Henry VIII wanted in a wife, so how she's presenting herself. And I also think it's in part a response to the fact of Anne Boleyn's execution, because Jane can have had no idea that Henry would have executed Anne Boleyn. Um, you know, even Anne Boleyn thinks she'll be sent to a nunnery. The fact that she is actually beheaded would have come as a huge shock to Jane. And I think Jane gets a lot of hate um, for what happens to Anne Boleyn. And I think it's it's unwarranted in that I really don't think that Jane would have had any idea that the king intended to execute his wife. And it very much doesn't set a precedent that she wants to be set. But it, yes, that's interesting. Um, turning to Hilary Mantel's um, insight into Jane, um, I know you're a huge fan of of the trilogy. Um, it is fiction, by the way, everybody. Just in case, let's Absolutely. just <laughs> let's just remind ourselves. Hilary was an amazing historian and praised by most academics for her historical research. For uh, for anybody who's writing historical fiction, she is regarded certainly in England or as one of the the top um, researchers in her literature. Um, there is this theme, that, let's just bring Thomas Cromwell into the picture if we might then. There is this theme that Hillary picks up on. And um, I'm just, uh, and the other thing is that from, um, from Jane's point of view, of course, Wolf Hall was the Seymour family home. And was it's not going. It's not far from where we're going to be holding the Wolf Hall weekend. So the Wolf Hall weekend is not being held at Wolf Hall. Just want to clear that up. Please don't go there because you'll be knocking on somebody's private home, um, and they won't probably appreciate it. But um, might it's be shocked. <laughs> yeah, it's just over the border in Wiltshire. Well, not far anyway. Um, there's a bit of Devon in the way, I think. Um, so we're in. We're going to be in, um, in Devon, and there's Dorset, and then there's Wiltshire. Um, but um, it was uh, Jane who um, whose home really gave the title. I don't think Hillary could resist Wolf Hall because it's just a, such a fabulous name. But I also think she couldn't resist it because um, of the th of all the wives, Jane is the one that appears in all three of the trilogy um, alive, and she dies uh, in childbirth at the beginning of the third. Um, the Mirror and the Light, uh, but she's there as lady-in-waiting to Catherine of Aragon, 
she, again, she's lady in waiting to Anne Boleyn. Um, and that's how uh, Thomas Cromwell meets her. And um, put it in context, Cromwell has recently lost his wife um, to the plague. And um, very, very, uh, I would say, uh, really um, discreetly, she hints that um, Thomas Cromwell might be considering Jane as a potential wife um, long before Henry VIII. So am I reading that? that correctly, Elizabeth, do you believe? Absolutely. Um, I, it's clear that, I mean, obviously we're seeing Jane, I mean, the, the joy of Hillary's work, and it's just so multi-layered, but we're viewing Jane as Cromwell, as Hillary Mantel's Cromwell sees her. So we're seeing her through his eyes. And there's clearly romantic undertones there. And in some cases, not entirely that subtly. I mean, Thomas Cromwell, Hillary's Thomas Cromwell is clearly interested in Jane um, and is potentially considering her as a wife. Do you have any, in your reading, do you have anything to back that up or or, or is this a literary licence? So it's um, there's no evidence of any kind of relationship between Jane and Thomas Cromwell. They certainly have connections. Um, Thomas Cromwell is involved in the plot to bring down Anne Boleyn, which, of course, the Seymour, Seymours are. Um, and Jane's sister actually marries Gregory Cromwell, um, Cromwell's son, which, of course, is in the book. Um, so they have a close family connection. They have quite aligned interests. Um, there's no evidence of any kind of romance but I think you know it, again it the joy of Hillary's work really is that it's what she presents is so plausible and I mean you know I would very much echo the view of other historians who think her research is wonderful and it's fiction of course but there's a great deal of plausibility there so while there is no evidence of any kind of personal relationship between Jane and Thomas Cromwell I think Hillary really brings across the possibility there could be, but I certainly wouldn't pin my colours to the mast and say that there was a relationship between Jane and Cromwell, I'm afraid. <laughs> okay, that's great. Uh, from a, a literary um, perspective as well, there's a device that she uses. So the book is called Wolf Hall, and we don't actually really hear about Wolf Hall until the very last 50-odd pages of the book. The last couple of lines of the first in the trilogy ends with, um, Cromwell deciding that um, on this summer's sojourn around the south of England when the king goes hunting and stays invited or uninvited uh, in various um, aristocratic homes. Um, and he says, before Bromham, uh, he makes a dot in the margin and draws a long arrow across the page. Now here, before we go to Winchester... We have time to spare. And what I think is, Rafe, is that we shall visit the Seymours. And he writes it down, early September, five days, Wolf Hall. The last line of, of the novel. And then picks that up instantly in the, in the second book, Bring Up the Bodies. Um, you can see my marker here. Um, one of the first themes of Bring Up the Bodies is Henry's um, new fascination with Jane, which really um, throws a, a spanner in the works, if you like, or a wrench in the works for um, Thomas Cromwell's designs on Jane. Um, as far as we know, was she ever a mistress, do we, do, do we think, before she became a wife of Henry? So she most likely hasn't slept with him um, because he seems to have considered her to be very pure, um, a virgin and innocent. However, um, they certainly have an early relationship, um, which may or may not begin when the court visits Wolf Hall. Um, we don't have any of the details of when they start to um, be involved with each other, but it would be surprising if the Seymours didn't push Jane forward while the king is at their own house. Um, you would expect her to be really quite prominent. Um, by the start of 1536, so not long after the visit, Henry is definitely involved with Jane. Um, there's one source that talks about Anne and Jane actually fighting at court, um, mm -hmm. scratching each other. Um, there's 
Henry is clearly interested. It all comes to a head that spring when he um, sends her a letter and a purse of gold and she throws herself onto her knees and refuses to accept either. She won't read the letter. Um, and she basically says, you know, I'm, I'm, I come from a, a poor but good family. Um, I'm looking for a husband. If the king would like to give me this present on my wedding day, then I will happily accept it, but I cannot accept it now. The letter most likely is suggesting very strongly that Jane join him in his, his bed. And this real theatrical performance um, puts a stop to any idea that Henry has that she'll be his mistress. And he's absolutely charmed by it. He actually, you know, he says um, she's incredibly pure. He's got honourable intentions. And to prove it, he will only see her with a chaperone. And to just sort of ease that process, Thomas Cromwell moves out of his own apartments at court, which are connected to the kings by a secret staircase, so that Jane's brother and his wife can move in instead to allow the king to meet with Jane Seymour, but always with a chaperone. So as far as Henry is concerned, she's a virgin. And certainly he doesn't take her virginity until at least they're betrothed. So no, she's never a mistress. Would she have become a mistress if Anne Boleyn had born a son? Because Anne miscarries a son during the early days of Henry's relationship. Jane may well have become the king's mistress if Anne Boleyn's pregnancy had continued. It's really the failure of this pregnancy makes it clear that potentially there's an opening in the wife department rather than just being a mistress. Yeah, that's fascinating. But um, she says she came from a good family. It's not a family uh, devoid of scandal, though, is it? There was, there was a really big shadow hanging over the family, which I don't know what happened to that. Did, did it just get brushed aside under... Uh, under Henry's time? Yes. So there is a big scandal at the heart of the Seymour family. And it's always been quite sort of t not entirely clear. So Edward Seymour, her brother, um, his first wife, Catherine Filial, um, gets repudiated. She gets sent to a nunnery. In fact, her father in his will leaves her money on the condition that she doesn't leave her nunnery, um, which sounds as so though something quite serious has happened. Um, her two sons by Edward Seymour are disinherited, particularly the eldest, John Seymour. He really doesn't seem to have been sort of accepted into the family. Um, it looks very much like she's taken a lover. And there is, in fact, a, um, I mean, Jane Dormer, who is a contemporary of um, all of these people. She actually, in her um, a biography of her written um, by, by her servant, actually refers to Edward Seymour as a cuckold, which again suggests very strongly that his wife has had an affair. There is a, a margin note, a 17th century margin note, which names Catherine Filial's lover as Sir John Seymour, who is, of course, Jane Seymour's father and Catherine oh. Filial's father-in-law. And this, of course, is very much brought out in um, Wolf Hall. Um, it does look very likely that it is, um, it, it, this is the reason that Sir John Seymour is not coming to court very much. Um, he actually dies either just before Jane becomes queen or, or afterwards, but he has no presence at court. And it is quite likely that this is what how the scandal played out, I, I would say, from my reading of the sources. Um, and it's hugely scandalous. Um, it would certainly hamper Jane's marriage chances to, to a very high extent. Um, we only know of one other marriage negotiation before Jane attracts the king. And um, this is, in fact, with the Dormer families, with William Dormer. And they run a mile when Jane is oh. suggested, um, which <laughs> suggests that she's sort of damaged goods to some extent. It's interesting. So the family name wasn't wholly acceptable. Um, but the king did, so did Henry overlook that? Was there any role of Cromwell in encouraging the Seymours was there any advantage in... So Crom oh, sorry. No, it's okay. So, sorry, I'm just getting, getting very into the Seymours. But yes, um, Cromwell very much is involved in the promotion of Jane. I think he's probably not necessarily the one who pushes her forward in initially, but certainly he gets on board. He's He can work with the Seymours. He's prepared to work with them. Um, I think Henry really, I mean, Jane has so many disadvantages as a royal wife that actually her father having an affair with her sister-in-law is kind of almost immaterial. She's um, she's very low born. She's not wealthy at all. Um, she's quite old for the role. Um, she's probably 
in her late twenties by the time she marries Henry VIII. Um, she's a bit on the shelf, really. Um, no, no one. There aren't any suitors sort of coming running for Jane Seymour. Um, she doesn't even seem to have been that attractive. Um, certainly, there are there are contemporary comments that don't compare her very favourably with Anne Boleyn, for example. So I think really. It's it's somewhat mysterious what Henry sees in her. I think it is that she is so different to Anne Boleyn and she seems like this placid little wife and he can sort of get on board with that to a great extent. So I think the scandal in the family is just one of many disadvantages to Jane Seymour. She is, I mean, she's the lowest born Queen of England that, that there has been, um, really until um, Kate Middleton becomes Queen, I would say, um, perhaps Camilla. But Jane Seymour is really lowly. Um, and, you know, Henry is prepared to ignore ver a great deal to marry her. And I think a scandal in the family, is it doesn't really matter. So we can't really talk about Jane without talking about Anne. We've sort of touched on Anne a few times. Let's just go back to um, that relationship between Anne and, and Henry. Um, I mean, certainly Hillary uh, is uh, very clear that Cromwell's rise to power in, in a major part was due to Anne Boleyn herself. It suited her when she needed it to have some somebody who could do her bidding um, around Henry and had to have Henry's ear and influence and rewarded him with the uh, Keeper of the Jewels, wasn't it, I think? Um, that, that. So why why did you, why do you think Cromwell was prepared to abandon the Boleyns along with, with that relationship between Anne, Anne and Henry? So they have a very public falling out. So in the spring of 1536, Anne and Cromwell very publicly row. I and mean, in fact, Anne is heard to say that she will have Cromwell's head. Um, and it seems to have been about the um, dissolution of the monasteries and where the profits should go. Cromwell, of course, is looking to enrich the king. Um, and apparently is attempting to to apply them for a more charitable purpose. Um, so again, it, it's it's all about the nuance, if you like. If you look at sort of Cromwell and Anne Boleyn on paper, they should be quite aligned. Um, mm. They've got similar um, interest in religious reform. Um, they're both, you know, relatively happy with the dissolution of the monasteries, but depending on where the profits go. Um, you know, they've got quite a lot in common. Um, Cromwell's background is more lowly than Anne Boleyn's, but, you know, they 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 should on paper be friends and they certainly do work together at first. I mean, I always think I always think we should look at Anne Boleyn less as a wife and more as a politician. Um, and I think that's really key to understanding Anne's role and her character in that um, she is, to some extent, you know, vying to be the king's first minister. Um, so there is an inherent rivalry with Thomas Cromwell's role. And of course, a woman in that period is not going to be appointed Lord Privy Seal or Lord Chancellor. And um, so she sort of rises through marriage. But I think that doesn't negate the fact that she's incredibly political, very, very active and not always on the same page as the king in the same way as Thomas Cromwell. So she's also attempting to influence Henry to change policy, to turn policy around. So I think there is an inherent rivalry between the two over who really does have Henry's ear. Um, but I do think it is this public falling out that really breaks the relationship between the two. And Cromwell understands that if Anne is his enemy, then he needs to be Anne's enemy. And a sure way to rid Henry of, or rid himself of Anne Boleyn is to provide Henry with a new wife. And I think there is a great deal of coaching going on with Jane Seymour. She's the right candidate at the right time. Yes, you hinted there that Jane had the same sort of religious agenda um, as Anne and possibly uh, Cromwell. Um, and is is that the occasion that you were referring to um, when we were chatting before about when Henry tells her to pull her head in? Um, is, was she pushing a, a religious agenda or a political agenda? Yeah, uh, so um, Jane Seymour, um, I mean, she's quite an enigmatic figure, partly because we don't have the dispatches of Eustace Chapuis for most of her queenship, which are mm. sort of full of gossipy information about Anne Boleyn. Um, Jane doesn't intervene overtly very often politically and I suspect because her position is quite insecure. Um, on one occasion she actually speaks out for the rebels in the Pilgrimage of Grace who are right. um, of course religious rebels. Um, they are 
um, moving against the king's religious changes, particularly the dissolution of the monasteries. And she actually says, you know, she she wonders if the rebellion is God's punishment to Henry for ruining so many churches. <laughs> and he actually very pointedly tells her not to meddle in his affairs and reminds her about what he's done to Anne Boleyn. And so, I mean, that's you can see why she doesn't intervene politically very often um, at that stage in her career, because she's not pregnant and could very easily be beheaded if Henry wants to do it. Religious wise, um, she's a bit enigmatic. She is frequently portrayed as a dichotomy with Anne Boleyn. You know, Anne is the Protestant queen and Jane is the Catholic conservative queen. And I think it's it doesn't do either queen justice to portray them in that way. I think there's a great deal of nuance. Um, Anne Boleyn is, is not a Protestant. I mean, she's, a, she's certainly interested in religious reform, but a lot of her um, her faith is very conservative. Um, we can see this in um, the Ash Wednesday sermon that her chaplain preaches before her death. Um, she swears her innocence on the sacraments. These are all very dogmatic, very Catholic. Yeah. Um, but I think also Jane Seymour, I think, we are doing her a disservice to view her purely as a traditional, as a Catholic queen. And actually, there are elements, in particularly in my new research on Jane, which suggests she's actually more reformist than I think we give her credit for. So I think there's more to be said, certainly, about Jane's religion. I think we need to pull the two queens apart to some extent and try and view them as individuals rather than as comparisons. Brilliant. Um, I, we could go on all day, <laughs> as usual, on these topics. And, and Elizabeth, thanks so much for your deep insight um, and knowledge of this. Can't wait for your next academic book on the subject of Jane. I think that's going to be quite exciting. Uh, before we join the meeting today, before we got on this podcast, uh, I was just reading on page 31 in my edition of Hillary's um, Bring Up the Bodies. And um, there's just this one little paragraph that she throws in. This is really uh, just before Henry leaves Wolf Hall, where he has certainly you know, started to get some designs on Jane. I thought it'd be nice for us to let Hillary have the last word, if that's okay, on yeah, this. Uh, yeah, she's, and she says this. Now, Jane is hiding behind a bush. Henry is nodding at her. He's speaking at her. He is impressing something on her. And he, Cromwell, watches, scratching his chin. Is the king's head becoming bigger? Is that possible in midlife? I love that. That's... Um... It's fabulous. It's so evocative. It's wonderful. I mean, you're there, but, you know, that's so... Um, you know, Cromwell does have his own point of view, and we should go on to say that actually Cromwell did not remarry, um, and he was quite elderly. Well, he he was um, in his late fifties when he uh, was finally beheaded by Henry, but um, it would have been interesting to see what would have happened if Henry the Eighth hadn't um, had his designs on Jane and gone gone with a, a foreign. A foreign suitor, that, as he did with Anna Cleves, of course, which was a complete disaster. But that's a, that's for another time. That's another story. Um, Elizabeth, thank you so much for joining um, today. I'm sure everyone has uh, would like to pass on our uh, thanks for um, your insights there, and uh, very much looking forward to uh, being with you next uh, next year, June the 22nd, 23rd. At Wolf Hall weekend. If anybody's interested in coming, there are still um, two rooms left in the house, so you've got to have to be quick because they're disappearing fast. But there's also lots of accommodation locally um, in and around the village where um, Cade House is set. So if you want to know more, it's wolfhallweekend.com and hope we can see you there. Thanks again, Elizabeth. Well, thank you very much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. You can follow and support the Tudor's Dynasty podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Patreon at Tudor's Dynasty.